Hello and welcome again to the Creepies Podcast, Season 5, Episode 222. In this fine episode, Bigfoot sightings, USOs, drone warfare, and UFO capital. Yeah. Okay, so welcome everybody. We're back from our break because we decided to go ahead and take one because, you know, sometimes you got to do that. Stuff gets in, uh, you know, you just got to take a break. Okay. Yeah, and we do that every so often. So uh, here's the deal. In this episode, we have a lot of stuff we're going to talk about. Some of it's pretty interesting and most of it's really interesting. <laughs> so you have some interesting things and then most are really interesting things. We've been pretty busy doing some stuff and Mildly taking care of business, trying to manage our time. Because we have some things coming up that we're uh, relatively excited about. Because I'm one of those guys, I don't really get too excited about stuff until it actually happens. Because I always dread every every bad, for you know, foreseeable thing that's going to happen before it actually does. That way I can plan for it. Anxiety. No, it's not called anxiety. It's called prior planning. <laughs> See, there's an expression that it used You're to be kicked around. Every aspect of anxiety, no, but giving uh, it a different word. Look, no, because if you plan for the worst... And something pops up, and you're ready for it. It can make an otherwise aggravating situation much better and shorter in duration. Hmm. For example, you get broke down in the desert. Mm -hmm. Your choices are fix it, wait for somebody, or die. Okay. What am I going to do? Fix it. Yeah, and how am I going to fix it? By being ready and prepared, which usually works out great unless somebody gets involved and takes the stuff that you would use to fix a critical situation and leaves it in the garage. And that's where innovation And replaces it with shoes. (laughs) Innovation comes in handy. (laughs) Well, okay. So that's what I'm saying. I like to plan and prepare for things because here's really what it boils down to. And I'm going to give all of you listeners out there under the age of 51 a little secret. (laughs) Do you want to know what it is? Sure. It's all about being inconvenienced. Mm. Everything that becomes an inconvenience is an aggravation. Okay. And as you get older, you just don't want to be... Two things, inconvenienced and aggravated. You know, there's a ton of like motivational speakers and personal coaches right now, like arguing that with you. They're probably like, no, every inconvenience is an opportunity. Yeah. You know what? So, that, of course they're going to say that. Oh, so you being stuck in the desert was an opportunity to flex your MacGyver skills. <laughs> I don't look at it that way. I look like, this is going to suck. It's already hot. I'm sweating in my own eyes. Let me go ahead and fix this so we can get back on the road and continue with our vacation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I don't have time for all that motivational stuff. I'm trying to keep us alive. And I'm referring to an event that happened to us about four years ago where I had to basically take the plastic piece off a solar light, some medical-grade duct tape, some Gorilla Glue, and put it together and fix our van so the cooling system, which exploded... Would allow to, you know, would be basically repaired and allow us to get to civilization so I could buy a $4 part in the shape of a plastic T. Mm-hmm. Which is funny because I had much better repair type stuff in the van underneath the passenger seat. You know, I had things like electrical tape and this little rubber tape that you can use to fix like hoses and plastic pieces that can break. Mm hmm which I was shocked to find that they weren't in there. And what was replaced was a little zipper bag of shoes hiking shoes because we were going on a trip and I needed a good place to store them. Hey, so you pulled emergency repair gear out and replaced it with hiking shoes. Was it marked emergency gear for the van? Did it have to be? Yes. What did I tell you before? I'm surprised you didn't take the fire extinguisher and the first aid kit out there too and go, let me go ahead and replace this with... Those are obvious and they're clearly marked. (laughs) With a curling flat iron and hairspray. Clearly marked first aid. Okay, look, here's the the deal. Clearly it's a You can fight this all you want. Guess who's going to be wrong? Both of us. You. No, not me. Why would I be wrong? No. 
Okay. Was it obviously <laughs> something that's supposed to be in the van? Yes, it was. Oh. Absolutely, because in that bag was electrical tape, mm-hmm. wire cutters, pliers, an adjustable wrench, all of which can be used to you know tighten a terminal on a battery. And having been make told some that repairs. the toolbox was in the back of the van, the toolbox that just seemed the like toolbox, excess tools. No, 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 no. See, you, you think it seems like excess tools. I am prepared mm-hmm. in the event of an eventuality. Well, now you know to mark everything. You know. Critical. Now you know. Not to touch my stuff. Okay, we, so we could have died on. I just should have not brought my hiking shoes. We had an entire Dodge Ram van, thirty five hundred, twenty one hundred feet long, which was packed right? full of you, solutions you, you, for panicking situations. You could have not full of clothes and things you need to enjoy your vacation. No, you were wrong. Absolutely one hundred percent wrong, and you know it. No, now you're just fighting it because. <laughs> we have we have all these solutions for all these worst case scenarios, but no clothes for our vacation. Uh, hiking shoes are not clothes. And how much hiking did you get to do in the desert when we were broke on the side of the road? None. You know why? I helped you, you find replaced some the, solutions. You replaced. <laughs> like, how just, did you help me? Re- okay. I kept the dogs cool. See, this is the problem mm-hmm. I'm dealing with. You, <laughs> you know why we kept the dogs cool? Because we had a pop up tent, which I said we should probably get in case we ever get broke down in the desert. <laughs> which probably took because up I knew room in my and heart. I couldn't fit shoes in no, there. No, 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 no. You're wrong. You were wrong. I think that's going to be the end of the podcast, <laughs> everybody. Know? So for six minutes, we're trying to put out a situation where somebody's getting all indignant. We're not going to start off a podcast Speaking with, oh, wrong. he's wrong. That's not going to be a new segment No, here. I was getting to the point where mm-hmm. you're the one that tried to throw out how, nope. you know, right now, right now, <laughs> motivational speakers <laughs> are going to be mad at me. Ooh, what are they going to do? <laughs> Cheer me up when I'm sweating my own eyes in the desert <laughs> as I go to unzip a bag and find... Stupid hiking shoes where there should be the rubber tape I need to repair. Mm -hmm. A hose rupture. Not clearly marked. Doesn't have to be. It wasn't yours. You shouldn't be digging it in the first place. Okay. Oh, what happens there? Oh, was that your stuff? So, hey. Okay. Let me ask you. Let me put a little scenario Mm -hmm. out before we roll into the podcast. Nope. So, you open a refrigerator and you see something that's not labeled. And it's probably somebody's lunch. Are you just going to take it out and throw it away because it's not properly labeled? And you better be real careful before you answer this. That's a different scenario. It's the same. It's It's all about inconvenience. (laughs) It is. It's all about being inconvenienced. Two things. Don't touch my stuff. Right. And if you looked in a bag and go, hmm, pliers, crescent wrench. Already a toolbox in the back. Light bulbs. Huh. All that stuff would be easily accessible to make a quick repair to get on the road. All that stuff's already in the back. No. Mm-hmm. No. Uh-uh. Wrong. <laughs> 100% wrong. <laughs> right next to the first aid kit and the fire extinguisher. By the way, we broke down right next to a very popular UFO sighting. So, But you wouldn't know. Because I spent all that time putting this crap together and hoping the sun would cook it on a flat rock so we could get out of there. <laughs> Because it was very hot. Feel free to look up the Socorro UFO incident. Yes. Yes. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> okay, so anyway, we're going to move back into the podcast. We do have a lot of stuff to talk about. And one of the things we're going to talk about is the wonders of USOs. Hmm. Unidentified submerged objects. And they're not really wonders. It's just a sort of a wondrous thing. It seems to be gaining, gaining cop- a little bit of popularity because of, well, UFOs are popular. But we're going to call them UAPs, right? Oh. And these are ones that occur underwater. Okay. Or in a large body of water. Doesn't necessarily have to be the ocean. But anyway, uh, also drone warfare and UFO capital. Which There's a surprising argument happening here. I got a lot to say about that. Now, keep in mind, with a lot of this stuff we talk about, it's just an opinion. (laughs) So I'm, I'm just letting people know ahead of time if they get mad. Because I don't think your town is the popular, you know, UFO capital of the world. You know? <laughs> don't come at me, bro. Just saying. Mm-hmm. All right, I mean, that's my little warning, right? So anyway, that's what it is. Okay, so with our particular podcast right here, there's a couple different ways you can contact us. So the easy way to contact us is go to our Facebook page, which is called what? 
Creep Geeks podcast. Shocking, right? Mm -hmm. And from there, you can interact with messages and little funny stories and anecdotes and memes and pictures and stuff like that we actually post. Or you can actually call a toll-free number that we have set up so that you could call and leave a message if you have something you'd like to share with us. And that phone number is going to be 575-208-4025. Yeah, and everything we talk about is located in our show notes. And our show notes can be found on what? Our Um, website. Our website, as well as, depending on your podcast player, they're right there for you. Yeah, and we're on every podcast player. Yes. And we're even on Audible. Ooh, we fancy. Yep. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, there you go. So, anyway, the pod, if you want to, like, go through and follow our show notes or whatever, if you think, oh, what were they talking about? I want to go into some more great Nagging Nash in detail. You can certainly do so. You can go to our website, which is creepgeeks.com. Yep. And there you can find what we've been talking about, our latest show notes from our latest episode. But you can also find the contact form there that you can click on and fill that out if you want. Mm. So, you have a couple different ways you can do that. So, yeah, that's what we do. Okay, so anyway, um, in the past, we've done th- gone through and talked about a couple of different things related to USOs, which we'll kind of go in a little bit more uh, detail, but primarily you think UFOs underwater, right? Yeah. So the term USO, which really doesn't seem to have a real definition, but it kind of re- really just sort of breaks down to this un- unidentified submerged object. And the reason why I'm putting this in here is because this term is something that, you know, kind of resonates with me. Used to be in the Navy, seen some weird stuff in the ocean. Recently, there's been reports from other people in the Navy who've seen some weird stuff in the ocean. And the funny thing about this report and the reason why I put it in there, which we'll talk about probably about another five minutes, is this this occurred roughly in the same area where I have seen some stuff. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. And my brother has seen some stuff, and my dad has seen some stuff. So it's it's just a thing. I'm like, oh, yeah, I can relate to that. So, yeah. But before we do that, anytime we have a Bigfoot sighting or Sasquatch sighting, it's anywhere close to us, or just anywhere in general, it's, you know, basically. Uh, in the U.S., we like to kind of talk about it and just to kind of see if it's something related to, you know, what we're going to talk about the podcast as far as, like, uh, something that I've noticed and that you've noticed in the past has been, you know, it seems like around June, July, heading into August and all that stuff, we get more reports of Bigfoot sightings. Yeah. Um, and at the time of this podcast, I was thinking, you know, we haven't really had any real Bigfoot sightings here recently. And then poof, like magic. Yeah. They show up. Uh, and then before we, you know, recorded half of this podcast, another one showed up. And it was, you know, when it has some nice video and I had to put it in here. And so we're going to talk about the one that came before this one. Uh, and this one basically is pretty pretty cool. It's like a second possible Sasquatch sighting was reported in Ashland County. Oh, okay. Now, do you know where Ashland County is? Well, there's a bunch of Ashland counties. I at first thought it was like Ashland, Virginia, but it is not. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so basically, Ashland County. Um, Indiana? Is it Indiana? I was going to say Ohio, but yeah, I think you're right. I don't know. Well, the newspaper article I'm reading online is the Kokomo Perspective. <laughs> so, right? So, anyway. Okay, so in Ashland County, there's a 51-year-old dude. And this guy freely professes an interest in Sasquatch phenomenon, right? Okay. Like it's some kind of, like, shame or something. You know, like he's like, yeah, I, you know, I like green beans. He's putting it out there all crazy, <laughs> right? Come on, man. So, um. But this guy has done, you know, two decades worth of work in law enforcement. He knows he saw something on June 9th that he can't easily explain. Okay. And this is cool because it ties back into the possibility of of an earlier sighting. It says, was it the second sighting of Bigfoot in 2021, right? And this Mm -hmm. is coming on the heels of a reported encounter near a 24-hour gym in April. Now, I read in April this report and i was like okay well you know and we don't talk about everything on the podcast but we do like to talk about news and when you get two possible sightings uh in the same area then it becomes more newsworthy than just you know we think we may have seen something right yeah so people can't really determine what this actually is uh people can't really explain it away and the guy said you know hey in all the years i've lived here i've never seen anything like it okay so he described the sighting and basically made it follow report on july 6th with National Sasquatch Guru, Matthew Moneymaker. Guru? We're, we're using that word in the paranormal community now? I get, well, these guys are. This is okay. the Kokomo. Oh, right? okay. Kokomo Times, is that what it is? Kokomo Times? Oh. No, I'm sorry, Kokomo Perspective. <laughs> right. So pretty much he said, you know, hey, they, they filed a, the guy, 
who filed a report, mm-hmm. July 6th, with National Sasquatch Guru, Matthew Moneymaker, and his Bigfoot Field Researchers Organization. All right. And he filed it with their website. Okay. You know, which, okay. <laughs> so uh, it says, here's some of the details, right? After a 90-minute summer rain, the man who asked his name not to be used in this story but freely professes his love of Sasquatch. Sasquatch. You know, um, he was aboard his riding lawnmower when he saw something near the tree line next to a recently planted soybean field. Hmm. And roughly about 250 yards away, a large all-black figure walking upright emerged from the tree line, uh, walking diagonally in a northeast direction across the bean field and then disappeared into another wooded area. So, stunned, the man stopped his mower and just watched. He had no way to record what he was seeing. Hmm. And some of the details also that he said is like, you know, it had been raining the night before I mowed. I normally keep the phone in my pocket, but I didn't want to have it with me in case it started raining again. And it happened so quickly, there had been no way, you know, to basically for him to go back to the house and grab a phone. He knew it would be gone. Yeah. And that's, you know, a lot of sightings are like that. You know, you just catch a brief glimpse of something, 15, 20 seconds, maybe 30 seconds. And you're like, did I really see that? Or even five seconds when you go whizzing down the road at 65 miles an hour and you think you see somebody standing off in the woods. And you're like, man, I can't, you know. Oh, well, yeah. So. He says, as the creature walked, the man drove his mower about 35 yards closer to the edge of the bean field, unable to get any closer. At that point, the dark figure was just east of the trail cam. I was hoping it would cross in front of. And it's talking about cross in front of the trail cam camera he's got set up. Yeah. Uh, but it would have stayed to the north of it, and it was following a deer trail. Hmm. And the whole time I was thinking, no one is going to believe me. Yeah. <clears throat> I was like, okay. So the man uh, said that the actual figure or the dark figure crossed the road of the field in about 90 seconds without any trouble, disappearing in the chest high weeds and then into the tree line. Uh, he watched for several minutes to see if the figure would reemerge, and it never did. Deep depressions in the terrain also provide cover. Um, and the man pointed out that someone could literally park a truck in one of them and would not be visible from its property. Hmm. So. Um, I don't know. He said, I also scanned the tree line for any vehicles just in case there was somebody there or someone out walking around, you know, in other words, see if there was like any other like people in the area. He said, there wasn't any, and he couldn't figure out what he'd seen. I finished mowing, but I didn't even tell my wife about it until a couple days later. Yeah. So. Hmm. And so he initially wondered if, a, if it was a neighbor, like checking the trail cam or perhaps a mushroom hunter. Huh? So he asked around and evidently subsequent checks with his neighbors. Found out that neither was the case. And he said, who would have been out after that pouring rain dressed in all black, he asked. And I'm thinking, well, he's out there cutting grass right after the rain. But, yeah. you know, he didn't find any footprints in the field, but later uh, found and photographed two large imp- impressions close to a nearby creek that could be footprints. It's hard to tell. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and that's true, too, because, I mean, after rain, the ground's pretty saturated. And, you know, sometimes you just can't get any real depressions, so. Um, here's where it gets good. Yeah. <laughs> Four days after the sighting, the man tried to reenact the moment using the services of his 5'11", 235 pound teenage son. We had him dressed in a black sweatsuit that had white lettering and stripes on it. My wife took him, uh, on the golf cart, right? I guess they have a golf cart too. Yeah. You know, to the area where the man saw the black figure and goes, I sat back at the wood pile on my mower to watch him. I had him put up his hood and walk the same path three quarters of the way through the field. Okay. Um, he showed the video of his reenactment to the source reporter on Friday and the dark figure of his son was clearly visible moving across the field. And the man realized that the dark figure he saw initially was larger than his son. Hmm. So my son was trying not to walk on the newly planted soybeans and was also... Uh, trying to miss the old corn stalks in the field. Because of this, it took my son longer across the road. Or the field, I should say. Uh, he was close enough that I could see the white parts of my son's sweatsuit. No problem. He said deepening his belief that the creature he saw on June 9th was completely black. Hmm. And the man said he continually tried to think of some other explanation for what he saw in the afternoon, but he just couldn't. It continued to bother me, he said, leading him to send the report to Matt Moneymaker's the guru, uh, Matthew Moneymaker's website. He goes, I didn't think it was bothering me that much, but it really was. <laughs> you know, 
He says, uh, he admitted he was surprised when one, when Moneymaker quickly contacted him and was even more surprised when the Sasquatch guru suggested he speak with the local media outlets. Hmm. So, uh, the expert, Moneymaker, who's been, who basically has seen the video and photos submitted by Ashland County Man, right? Yeah. So, it's a Class B observation which is for incidents where a possible Sasquatch was observed at a great distance or in poor lighting. Yeah. He isn't sure about it because the evidence, Moneymaker said uh, in an interview from his California home, um, it very well could have been a Sasquatch. He's a credible witness who also tried to recreate what he's seen. And he's lived there long enough to know that you don't usually see people walking back there, especially coming out of the woods right after the rain. Uh, Moneymaker said that the man was right on the edge in terms of the distance of the creature. He could see the figure, see the color, right? See it walking upright, see how fast it was moving, but it was difficult to see, uh, to say at the distance, right? If what you're seeing is actually covered in fur or not. Yeah. You know, cause you know, you get to a certain point, you can't really, you know, get some of those distinguishing details. You're just not going to get right. Um, <clears throat> so pretty much. The guru, right, he says the sighting occurred in, in the kind of habitat where moneymakers said the Sasquatch would prefer plentiful, prefer plentiful, plentiful, plentiful deer, plentiful water sources nearby, dense wood that offer cover, places to hide and shade. So now the earlier sighting was in April. Yeah. Right. And it was reported by a woman who said she saw a grayish creature around midnight. And it like outside of like a gym, you know? Yeah. And he said that basically the second sighting could have been the same animal. And I wonder if the artificial lighting could have affected the creatures or could have reflected off the creature's fur in such a way that it made it look grayish. Uh, I do think it's very possible that it's the same one. The man here saw a pretty tall critter moving along in a pretty good clip. Yeah. And there's nothing that he or I would have found yet that could, be, you know, could rule it out being a Sasquatch. And there's nothing that also shows it's, you know, clearly a person. So, of course, Matt Moneymaker is on Finding Bigfoot, uh, you know, from the Animal Planet. And so I thought it was pretty interesting. So there was two reports, you know. Yeah. You know, it, it's, is this a Bigfoot 100%? I don't know. I mean, you know, you can't, you can't say. It's definitely something. And some of the rationalizations here, I'm like, eh. But two different people within a small region had a similar encounter with something unknown that was very large and was bipedal yeah. basically uh the whole i think it was artificial lighting that could have reflected off the fur mm. well i mean or maybe uh, it is gray and the dude mowing the lawn right after the rain saw a sasquatch that was wet or something i don't know yeah well i mean yeah. it, it, I, that that's the kind of stuff that's really hard to you can't really go either way you know and, and the hilly terrain because thing? what kind of street lights or yeah. what kind of lights did they have did they have like the yellow you know, sodium lights that throws off the white balance of every picture you try to take and gives it that nice yellow, you know, sort of color. Yeah. Um, you know, were they white lights? You know, the fact that, you know, gray or dark, I mean, depending on the distance, could be... It could be the same. Sh- it could be off black. Who knows? Yeah, it could be really, really dark brown yeah. that looks black from a distance. I know I ask, you know, friends what color is that, and we'll get into an argument because, you know, it's... Everybody thinks certain colors. What color is that? I think it's sand. No, it's taupe. Yeah, it's like it's not even a real color, man. (laughs) Hey, (laughs) so. But what's really interesting is yes, this is two sightings within a reasonable amount of time of each other, and the witnesses, they're even though they may or may not have an interest in the phenomenon, they're being very genuine. Well, the one guy has an interest. Yeah, he says he does, and I think it's because he has an interest. He decided to go ahead and recreate it. Yeah. Which was good. Which they do on the yeah. show. I mean, if you look at like Finding Bigfoot and stuff like that in other shows, they, they go and they recreate it to I try to, to get an idea, he, you know, and I think that's great. He pointed out how his son, it took him longer because he was deliberately avoiding soybeans and um, I guess where the rows were tilled. But that makes me go, well, then the original sighting, did you look on the soybeans or on the areas that have been tilled for more evidence? I mean, who knows? Yeah. But I thought it was pretty interesting just to, you know, kind of read that. But, you know, the takeaway from it was, I mean, okay, cool. It's it's another sighting that's reported, and there's been some kind of effort to try to, you know, prove or disprove. But, you know, guru. Yeah. 
I'm looking Sasquatch at the Sasquatch guru. Terrain like, in this. Huh? And I'm like. Just a big old soybean field, man. Wide open. Hmm. I wouldn't want to walk across it when it was like really wet. Yeah. Or just after a rain, it'd be soft. Probably hard to get through. So anyway, that's pretty cool. So I thought that was kind of neat. I'm like, oh, there's two sightings there. And they were in just the you know completely different sort of places, right? You got one that's outside a gym. And then you got one that's out in the field. But it is sort of a rural area. You know, I mean, there's soybean fields. So. Yeah. And they show a picture on the website. I don't know if it's the actual field or not, but I'm like, well, that looks like big, like a farmer type field. Yeah. Not a farmer expert, but that's kind of cool. So I'm like, all right, well, that's pretty neat, right? And then in my quest, I come across some other things as well. But this is the one that I put in there because it's been a recent thing which I thought was really interesting, but I don't know how I feel about it. It was a wild video that has some people convinced that Bigfoot was spotted crossing a river with a baby. Yeah. So, you know, baby Bigfoot, that's kind of a weird thing. And what I when I see this video, and it is long, like from a long distance, you know, away, and it looks like if it's filmed with a potato and all that sort of thing, it's hard to tell. You know what it is, because at first glance, you're thinking somebody's just kind of walking across wearing like a suit. But, you know, some people say it's a it's a baby and other people say it's a deer, like a little baby deer, like food. You know, OK, and the video um, and we got this off the sun dot com and we have a link to it. And this clip has got one hundred fifty thousand views on YouTube. People were debating with the brown figure was really a Bigfoot or a hunter crossing the water. And this is in Michigan. I didn't realize you posted this. I'm going to just wreck this whole thing. <laughs> okay, well, good. You just wait just a second, okay. right? Get some details. So the footage was submitted to the Rocky Mountain Sasquatch organization by a, a person identified as Eddie V, who claims that his cousin was kayaking in Michigan's Cass River uh, in the beginning of July when he spotted a creature. He goes, not sure what it is, but I've sent it to a few people to see what they say. And some say it's a Bigfoot carrying uh, a baby Bigfoot. And others say it's a Bigfoot carrying a deer. Mm-hmm. And when they zoomed in to the grainy video and slowed it down so viewers could get a better look, and there indeed is a large brown figure carrying something that could be seen moving through the water at a quick pace. Okay. So whatever it is, is moving around, right? Um, so some people suggested that it's a guy in waders crossing the water and basically said that the area is a popular fishing and hunting spot and others were convinced what else could it be? Yeah. And, you know, of course they talk about sightings in the U S where it says sightings of a large hairy Bigfoot like creatures occur across the U S every year in heavily wooded areas. And more than 10,000 people have claimed that they've seen the mythical creature over the past 50 years. Hmm. And then they also talk about the, you know, Oklahoma created like a Sasquatch hunting season, which we talked about and people were getting all worked up over that. Yeah. So, in September 2006, something Sasquatch-like was caught on a live stream, which was set up to film a nest of baby eagles. I thought that was kind of neat. A large black human-esque figure could be stomping through the forest and disappearing back in through the undergrowth. So, um, it gives some examples. The clip itself is not very long, and it's from a shot far away. And when I first watched it, I thought it was a person trying to be Bigfoot cruising across the river. Yeah. So I I don't really know, you know, it's one of those things where it's interesting. Can you say definitive definitively it is what it is? No, I don't know. So you said you were going to like do something to this, you know, the, the idea of being, are you going to smash it? Yeah, because smash it, smash the clip with your, with your knowledge. (laughs) Allegedly this footage has surfaced uh, about six years ago, six or seven years ago. Yeah. Um, and funny enough, the only thing, the same about this is this alleged Eddie V who Eddie V was related somehow in the last time this video surfaced um, or pictures, I, I should say. And there are people right now, different organizations, some of them that we follow who are trying to figure out when this video content was originally posted. We have seen claims of this sa- these same stills being used in places like Florida, Virginia, specifically Chesapeake and Suffolk, Virginia. And um, at one point, I want to say it was like, uh, what's right above Florida, Georgia? Yeah. So 
This same, these same stills, different stills from these same scenes have been used to claim Bigfoot sightings. And it's always been Bigfoot eating. Now, for some reason, they're saying it's Bigfoot holding a baby. And I'm, I'm not convinced at all because what I see is, like you were saying, I see a hunter covered in mud and in waders. And it looks like he's cleaning a fish. And at one point, he looks directly at the camera. So, from what I understand, there's a couple of Bigfoot groups out there right now, specifically on Facebook and Reddit, who are currently trying to debunk this. And they've got some good evidence. I've seen some posts of showing these same pictures showing up about six years ago. Yeah. So, not convinced. Neither am I, but, you know, hey. I thought it was interesting. I was hoping. I was like, what? Yeah. I can't say what it is. Can't say for sure. Nobody can, and that's the problem. I mean, you could easily dissuade people and say it is not Bigfoot and that it is what it is, but at the same time, you also can't be 100% sure. But anytime you see, um, like, footage or evidence or whatever recycled, it just makes you wonder. Yeah. So, yeah. But anyway, we have a link to that in the show notes. If you want to check it out yourself or if you hit Facebook or somewhere like that, you've probably already seen it. Um, So it is what it is. I just want some new original videos to show up. Yeah. Um, I think we all do. Yeah. Yeah. So, all right. Anyway, what we're going to do is we'll take a quick break. And when we come back, we're going to talk about a new Navy witness who said he saw a Tic Tac UAP operating underwater. Okay. So that should be kind of cool. Audible is audio entertainment that entertains, educates, and inspires. For you, listeners of Creep Geeks Podcast, Audible is offering a free audiobook download with a free 30-day trial to give you the opportunity to check out their service. To download your free audiobook today, go to audibletrial.com forward slash cheap geek. Again, that's audibletrial.com forward slash cheap geek for your free audiobook. So, okay, so when we talk about Tic Tac UFOs, it's been really popular, right? Yeah. UFO thing has exploded. You know, we've got Congress and we've got the Navy and all this stuff's been going on for a couple of years now. And the one interesting part of the entire thing that sort of got my attention is the idea that these things can operate underwater. And if you don't know what the Tic Tac is, it's basically an object that was seen flying super fast, right? Mm-hmm. And Navy pilots were seeing it. It dipped into the water, didn't leave any sort of, like, you know, no splash, no evidence that it actually went in the water, disappeared for a while, come popping back up and kept doing its thing. Okay. Now, the idea of USOs or underwater submerged objects has been around for a long time. What's not something that's too common is people actually reporting that they've seen stuff. Hmm. Like people in the military. Now, I've seen some stuff, and I couldn't explain, you know. And I thought that was, you know, something that was pretty pretty cool. It was like, whoa, somebody else seen some stuff. Now, here's the deal. There's areas of the ocean that are, like, really deep and unexplored. There's also areas that are also used by the military all the time. Yep. And there's areas that, you know, we call... Triangles like the Bermuda Triangle and the Devil's Triangle and all stuff where things go in and disappear, whether it's, you know, weather phenomenon or something more nefarious or a possibility of UFOs or whatever. It's kind of hard to say. In this particular area where this person's seen something, kind of falls into that sort of category, right? Mm-hmm. I'll just tell you what he said. Now, this person was on the USS Nimitz and, uh, okay, so... I was staring into the water from above when a large, fat, white tic tac object, approximately twenty meter or twenty feet in length, suddenly appeared in my view below me, moving right and darted into the dips as fast as it appeared. I couldn't really comprehend what I saw. It was definitely a solid object, and when it descended, its forward and its forward end rapidly collapsed in on itself, and it just kind of disappeared. And he was actually on the Carl Benson. I'm sorry, not the Nimitz. Yeah. And he was a petty officer. Yeah. So he's E4, he's a petty officer, he's he's on uh, the Carl Benson, which is basically a Nimitz-class supercarrier. Yeah. 
And this was in 2010, and he was in Haiti, right, delivering humanitarian aid after that country's devastating earthquake. Mm -hmm. And at the time, Bowman, which is what his name is, John Bowman, was a gunner's mate, and he was on a break doing what all sailors do on break, looking out across the main reason why they become sailors, which is hanging out on the side looking over the ocean, right? Yeah. Um, and that's what he's seen. So he's seen this sort of thing, right? And this, you know, he, he basically told us to Ryan Sprague or Sprague from, you know, the Trail of Saucers webpage. And this guy has seen everything, right? The usual stuff like sharks, dolphins, whales, giant squid, sea turtle, swordfish. You, know, you, you do, you see it all. At night, you see biologics out there that when the, you know, the pressure from the, from the bow pushes them along, they turn colors like blue, pink, red, you know, yellow. You just, you just see stuff. Yeah. And I like the quote, everyone sees weird shit in the ocean. And, and that's, that's true. That's from his supervisor. Yeah. <laughs> He tells Absolutely. him the problem. He, well, he tells him his experience, and the su- supervisor goes, everybody re- sees weird shit in the ocean. Mm-hmm. And I can picture him, like, putting his hands up, like, yeah. <laughs> now, having been in the military, in the Navy, if you go to your soup, your supervisor, and go, hey, man, you'll never guess what I see. The quote, that the, the response that he got back, everyone sees weird shit, basically says it all. And what that says is, we all see weird stuff. Do you, are, you know, is it worth reporting or not? What's mm-hmm. going to happen if you do report it and all that sort of thing? And really, at the end of the day, at, at that time, nothing. Yeah. Because how do you report something like that? Well, now we have a system in place, but right. before then, you didn't. You didn't, definitely didn't in 2010. Like, yeah. you know, I seen some weird stuff in the ocean. Now, chances are nobody would care. Yeah. Now, if you said, I think I seen you know, a 20 foot diameter submarine or something that has some kind of mechanical propulsion or something like that. It could possibly you know, pose a threat to national security or the ship or anything in between. They're going to do something about it. Yeah. Maybe look for it. Maybe contact other vessels in the area and say, Hey, what do you got anything on sonar? You got anything on radar? You got anything, you know, to see if anything is in the area, whether it's a threat or what, you know, but when it comes to, comes to things that can't be described as mechanical or man-made, it was typically considered a biologic. Okay. Which is a natural, like a, you know, whale or... Very fast po- pot of killer whales or dolphins or whatever. Yeah, and you know, you know, in that area, though, off of Haiti, you don't really see killer whales. But, I mean, yeah, like okay. dolphins, porpoises, you know, schools of shrimp, things, weird stuff that could, you know... Uh, there's all sorts of, like, there is weird stuff in the ocean, you know? Okay. Now, I've seen something similar where i seen what looked like a big glowing sort of ball of phosphorescence kind of flat, just kind of cruised underneath the ship and just sort of went on off. And I was sitting there uh, on the side of the boat, basically we're looking out, like they said, like all sailors do. And I'm just like sitting out there and just kind of hanging out. And it went right on by and I was like, huh, <laughs> what the hell was that? You know? <laughs> and did I say anything? You know, what are you going to say? I saw a glowing ball of phosphorescent light. I saw something weird that went underneath the ship and kept on going and disappeared. You know, did anybody else see that? And, you know, there was a couple other people out there with me, and they were like, huh. Nobody said squat and went right on back to doing what you're doing because you don't know, you know. And and at the time, it never occurred to me that it might be something. At the time, you know, it kind of showed up and disappeared and went on about and nothing bad happened. It wasn't like, you know, we didn't register anything as a threat. Nobody freaked out and ran around. I was like, what the hell's that? Cause you know what? You see weird stuff in the ocean. Uh, I don't know that, that I can definitely see you and some other people who I know who are in the military or been in the Navy go, huh? But for me personally, I say, huh? When I see the squirrel in the front yard, figure out the bird feeder. Yeah. But if I see a UFO, I'm going to be like, I'm not going to be like, huh, <laughs> kind of yeah. going to be beside myself. So now I'm sure now that if you've seen anything like that, you'd report it because now there's a way to do it. And now it's become more of a on the radar kind of thing. Like, hey, guys, if you see anything, you know, see something, say something, right? Yeah. But yeah, but I thought that was kind of funny because, you know, I've seen stuff that I can't explain, and, you know, but it's like, okay. What is that? You see weird stuff in the ocean, right? Yeah. But the area in that area in the Caribbean, it's like, okay, yeah, there's a lot of weird stuff out there. Yeah, especially when you get in, get in between like Haiti and like Puerto Rico and stuff. And but yeah, when I read that, I was like, I can relate. Yeah. Huh. 
And everyone sees weird shit in the ocean. I think the difference between here and there is basically now you see something, there's a way to report it. There's something that you can do to have it documented. And when you should see it, you should say it. Because a lot of times, you know, you're out there doing stuff just in general in the military. And it may be, you know, completely crazy to anybody who is not in the military. Yeah. Or doesn't have experience. You know what I mean? Like your daily operating sort of procedure can be completely different to someone who's not in the know or doesn't have that experience, you know? Like if I said, hey, I'm going to need you to get up at 4 o'clock in the morning and go out there and grab this cable and hold it real tight, but not too tight, between your ship and another ship, <laughs> right? As we're both going down in the water at the same time doing parallel course and speed, for about 20 miles, I need you to hold this cable, and on the end of this cable, in, in basically segmented lengths, is little white squares of canvas who have been it has been painted in different colors, like red and green and yellow, with different numbers, so that we know how far apart the ship is. So that we know the distance between the ship you're on and the ship you've got the other side of that string tied to. We know that the distance between the two ships is like, say, 100 yards or whatever. Okay. But, yeah, hold it tight, but not too tight. Oh, keep in mind, both ships are going to move in their own direction, but we're going to try to parallel course and speed. So, oh, if you let it go, we don't know how close the ships are. We'll probably run in each other and kill a bunch of people. And while we're doing this, and you're trying to do this and hold it nice and tight, we're going to pump hundreds of ga- thousands of gallons of gasoline and fuel, JP5, whatever it is, jet fuel, over to your ship and crane over pallets of sodas and food and stuff like that. Why not use... <sighs> and at the very end of this, mm-hmm. when you got sea spray and all that stuff flying all over and you're trying to hold the two ships together, mm-hmm. and we're done, we're going to break away from them really fast and play some cheesy music as loud as we can over the speakers. Okay, this sounds like... And we're going to call it the breakaway song. Oh, God. This sounds like busy work. <laughs> No, it's supplies. It's called underway Why replenishment. Why not use equipment to measure the distance between the two ships? Well, because the ships are moving. Because when you get two ships close together like that, it creates what they call a trough. And basically, it's a you know a large, turbulent mass of water that's flowing between both the ships. You want more than one way to do distance. Okay. So, and it's been done that way for a long time. And for a very long time, the U.S. Navy is about one of the only countries in the world that could do this efficiently without killing everybody. Huh. Yeah. And so both ships break away at high speed to just get away so that way you don't have to worry about stuff. And so you have to pick a breakaway song. And like little cheesy little ships would play stuff like this theme to St. Elsewhere and dumb stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah. One of my ships, we played uh, Kiss Rock and Roll all night because it was funny. And everybody kind of dances. It's just, it was weird, man. Yeah. See? You'd be like, what? And, you know, we went through all that stuff wearing, like, helmets and you know, big life vests and tucked in the battle dress. We've refueled with, like, the Australians who were wearing, like, shorts, <laughs> a floppy hat, pair of sunglasses, and combat boots, and had one guy standing there holding the one cable, and it was on a winch on the other, and he's just talking to us the whole time, okay. yelling at us. We're ready. Just in case the ship explodes, we're ready. And this guy's got basically shorts and a pair of boots. Okay. okay, guys. <laughs> it's like it's, it's just a difference in things. So anyway, yeah, that was kind of crazy. So here's something else kind of crazy. We've talked about drones in the past. We've talked about drones flying around, and the idea that drone technology is way more advanced than what we currently know or see, and what we may be seeing with some of these reported sightings is basically drones and drone technology, right? Yeah. And we've also talked about the idea that, you know, hey, if the military is saying that they don't know what these things are and it is possible to be in drones, and if they don't know what it is and they can't identify it, how can they protect against it? That's where we had that conversation about building a, a drone detection system right. right there in the Gulf. Yeah. Well, yeah, along the coast and that sort of thing. Other countries are doing it too, so we're definitely not the only one. But the idea of taking, like, say, a bunch of drones together, giving them that sort of swarm or hive mind mentality and putting them on a mission and stuff, and it's really hard. Can you imagine trying to... Let me give you a weird analogy. So you're out in the woods and you need to, I don't know, shoot something. It'd be easier to shoot something like a squirrel, Mm -hmm. right, with a rubber band gun than it would be to shoot like a a swarm of flies. Okay. 
So if drones are much smaller, faster, maneuverable, can do all that sort of crazy stuff, and they're so small in general, it's going to be really hard to shoot drones out of the sky, right? Yeah, it's the buckshot versus single. Right. Yeah. So the issue really is becomes like, how can you protect against something like that? And if these are advanced technology drones, you got to have somebody to protect. And I came across this article that basically said the Navy's exotic, exotic M-80 stiletto test ship defeated drone swarms at sea during trials. Okay. I think that's great. Yeah. Because what happens if you send like a swarm of a hundred drones all carrying like high explosives and stuff towards the ship? It Didn't can we cause mention a lot of them trying starting these tests? Or well, the, it was yeah. theory, but now evidently the experimental test ship, the M80 Stiletto, um, successfully completed a six week demonstration of an automated 360 degree detect and defeat anti drone system. Hmm. And in the demonstration, saw the M80 go up against drone swarms. Um, of which has been described as a wide range of unmanned robotic threats, and the Navy's one-of-a-kind littoral vessel um, and an automated anti-drone system highlights the increasingly significant threat that lower-end unmanned systems pose to naval operations. Okay. So the anti-drone system, uh, which was tested aboard the Stiletto, is called the Drone Century, Century X, manufactured by an Australian defense contractor named Drone Shield. Remember we talked before about, um, what was it, Able Wingman? Yeah. And some of these other sort of, you know, government sort of things where the military can take these drones with them and task them on missions and things like that, including like, you know, detection, defense, um, you know, spying, I guess, all that kind of crazy stuff. So I was kind of glad to see something like this in place where, you know, there could be some defense against, like, drone, drone swarms. I'm looking at their website now. Mm-hmm. Like, hmm. Yeah, so they basically take this thing. It's like look, looks like a pod, and you know, they basically look for drones. And if a drone swarm comes in, right, here's what it says. The company uses artificial intelligence to analyze the surrounding radio frequency environment and identify potentially hostile drones. Once the system identifies the particular radio bands used by those drones, it then activates a non-kinetic jamming for controlled management of response to threats. Hmm. And this is the reason why I put this article in here. Non-kinetic jamming. So kinetic is like, an example of a kinetic weapon would be a gun. Mm Mm-hmm. It fires a round, and that round has kinetic energy, and it hits you, so basically it's kinetic, right? Okay. It's not like an energy-based weapon necessarily where, you know, you think of like a laser beam or something like that. This is basically using radio. It's jamming. It jams the drones, effectively sort of blinding them and disrupting how they actually work, and they just sort of fall out of the sky. Would a jamming system, like what this may be, would that interfere with the sensors and operation of other gear, like a helicopter or a nearby small lightweight plane or well, the Colorado Sheriff's Department trying to track down the UAPs that were plaguing that one area of Colorado for a, like two months? Absolutely. Hmm. Okay. Okay, so like say you had a, a uh, a home phone that worked on 900 megahertz. Yeah. And that's how you, you're making a phone. Like you have your own little home phone. It's wireless. You're walking around the house. It's 900 megahertz, right? Yeah. Now, if you create an opposing 900 megahertz signal that's louder and stronger, then you can jam it to where you're talking to somebody and all of a sudden it just goes to static and you lose your connection. Can these drones operate or fluctuate on what signals or frequencies they were? I don't know, possibly. Okay. But this thing, you know, drone sentry, I would think would be able to run across a wide range of frequencies and transmit them and do all the magic that it does to sort of defend against that. So it's like jamming signal. You ever seen on, on when they're trying to do something, they go, we're being jammed. Yeah. The frequency, be- that's what this is. So why is this being taken into consideration more than a short burst EMP or something like that. Well, think about if you could basically point a speaker 
at something, right, or a transducer of some kind, and blast them with this signal. Okay. And it basically disrupts everything, and it, this thing falls out of the sky. Isn't that much better than trying to shoot, like, you know, a bunch of buckshot at something, hoping hoping that you hit it? Mm. Because, you know, the way buckshot works, let's just use, like, a, you know, a buckshot or scatter gun, the further those projectiles get away from the barrel, the further they spread. Okay. So that, like, 10, 12 feet in front of you, you still have a pretty close grouping of these buckshots. Mm-hmm. But at 200 feet, they're spread so far out, you've created basically gaps in between one buckshot to another piece of buckshot, maybe 5, 10, 20 feet wide. Okay. Whereas if I just zap you with a microwave type thing or something is transmitting signals and jam the frequencies and now you're, you, your drone effectively can't think or operate, you know, mm-hmm. problem solved. So, if this technology exists to protect against drones, they even show it like, hey, you get this thing mounted on its portable detect and defeat mounted on top of a pickup truck. Yeah. It looks like a car ad, and I'm kind of, like, impressed. I'm like, ooh. I think they do that kind of stuff on purpose because you know what that means, right? What? Well, a a car or a truck is less expensive. You know, you can go buy it. Mm -hmm. It's readily accessible. It's less expensive. You can mount this thing right on the roof and go down the road. That would mean that overall you'd think the cost would be less. It's accessible. Replacement parts would be quick and easy. The supply and demand sort of thing would be uh, much easily and quickly fulfilled. But this ad makes it look like the way it looks. The f- I don't think military uh, usage. I'm like, ooh, this is like a storm chasers thing. That would be really cool. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean. Just launch a bunch of drones into a tornado and see which ones pop out. There may have been a movie like that where they were yeah. using like soda cans and stuff. And to, cows. <laughs> yeah. But, I mean, we talked about it before. We talked about the idea that drone technology is, is getting where it is. And, and I think even, um, I mean, okay, so drones are becoming so popular. I do think that in the future, if there's going to be wars and conflicts, it will be unmanned based. It'll be, you know, there'll be controllers and that sort of thing. But I think if you get these drones out and these technologies are cheaper mm-hmm. yeah they can do the job in a way that um you worry less about manpower and man you know just there's less human involvement there so the risk is less and i hope though that since this has become the argument with drones and in the general is that there's less worry of human casualty unless you're of course you're the intended target uh i, I still hope that maybe this, the idea of using force will not become a more, um, I'm just, here's what I'm afraid of. I'm afraid that, you know, since you can use drones to do this sort of thing, that you're just going to basically go for violence a lot faster than you, if you had to really sort of assess the situation. In other words, it's easier to send a drone to do somebody's job if you don't have to worry about getting your side involved as far as like you know the threat. And there's there's been a couple of presidents who like to u- who liked to use drones to do that sort of thing. But I would, I don't know. Something in me thinks that if we're moving up in technology, that also means we are moving up in civility. You know, in a sense that rather than take using drones, <laughs> you would think so. Yeah, I can think of one example though that. that kind of throws it in the trash i know but i would hope that the use of drones is to minimize the loss of human life and even now where we're not currently using well we're not currently aware that we're using drones we are still like sending in humans to like um disarm a terrorist group's oil or gas base you know resources or to destruct you know some sort of uh utilities that they need or to rescue certain people uh, we're still sending in human lives whereas if both sides were to function u- utilizing unmanned drones it'd be like well i'm going to take out your power grid nobody's dead but i took out your power grid you know that type of stuff well i think as the progression of technology rolls on mm-hmm. and the advanced threat detection and the artificial intelligence and all that sort of thing gets more and more refined that that will be the case. Yes. That's what I'd hope. <laughs> but 
then you got to worry about what every sci-fi writer eventually <laughs> writes in, in Great Warning. Yeah, Skynet. <laughs> when these things become fully aut- you know, autonomous and can think on their own, they're just going to determine that, well, the real threat to all this is the people that are sending me out to take care of the threats to the people, yeah. and then all of a sudden we become the targets. And then we start thinking back to when you had, like, wasn't it Google's computer talking to Facebook's computer and their artificial intelligence were talking to each other yeah. back and forth? And no, they it, got was to, Microsoft. it was yeah, Microsoft. Yeah, Microsoft. And, I think Google. I Facebook think. was in there, too. Somehow yeah. Facebook was like a third wheel. They created the, These two machines decided they couldn't talk fast enough with the language they were given, so they made their own. Yeah. And it, according to the articles, the people involved with this were freaking shocked and like, oh, shit, we need to turn this off right now. But did they? Did they turn it off? I don't know. But it goes back to where, okay, so if if you can buy this system to defend against drones, and you can buy drones, and you can actually buy drones and have them fly with a swarm, you know, the the hive and the swarm and all stuff, and create, like, figures in the sky and do all stuff. Imagine what the government who's been doing this for a while has. Yeah. Maybe alternative propulsions. Maybe propulsions that don't have to worry about the physical limitations of a human pilot. They could do all this sort of stuff. You know, which is more likely somebody from outer space doing this or the government going, you know, with this advanced propulsion technology, we don't have to worry about all this stuff and it can break the rules that we're used to. Okay. But good thing we have this drone sentry thing <laughs> that you can put on top of your SUV and just signal jam everybody. I mean, there's ways to do that too, where you can take a CB radio and a truck driver driving down the road has like a, a pretty amplified setup so he can talk across the country. He can key his mic and turn off your cell phone. Hmm. It's kind of illegal, but you got to get caught first. What do you think about that? Sure. So you know who the real UFO capital is? No, apparently I don't, according to this article. Well, who did you think it was? <sighs> Not looking at the article here to take a guess. Honestly, UFO capital. Honestly, I would guess either the Pacific Northwest or I'd guess the Southwest. Someplace in one of those places. That's where I'd guess. You know? Yeah. That Solid guesses. And then we had that whole article about them building the anti-drone detection or anti-UFO detection thing. And they're building something off the coast, like in the Gulf. And I'm like, eh. and I argued that because I was like, no, there's so many other capitals, UFO capitals, so many other places that get more sightings than the Gulf, you know? Yeah. And I, again, I was like, no, Southwest, Arizona, Texas, New Mexico, New Mexico, maybe the Pacific Northwest, um, maybe Northern California. Those are the places I think of. Not what's in this article. Yep. At all. I mean, heck, Virginia ranks higher, in my opinion. Well, according to this article, right, we have Mm -hmm. a state known for great cheese and beer, (laughs) Wisconsin. So Wisconsin has lots to offer in the way of UFO research, and it's reportedly so steeped in E.T. history and lore that, in fact, they have three different towns all claim to be its UFO capital. Okay. So the Wisconsin towns of Dundee, Elmwood, and Belleville each present compelling arguments as to why they have the most deserving of honor, the, you know, basically UFO capital. And they celebrate accordingly each year. Okay. You know what this reminds me of is when we read the article about who's basically going to be corn kings. Corn kings? Yeah, because they had the festival. Okay. We're the best corn festival. They're like, no, we're the best corn <laughs> festival. And they were duking it out. And even though they were sl- like slandering each other. And then it even got us where we, when we left New Mexico, one of the big battles that was happening was the chili peppers. Yeah. Colorado was like, we have the best chili. Yeah. And New Mexico was like, oh, I don't oh, think oh, so. Oh, heck no. And it went round and round. And the governors were fighting even to the point where New Mexico instantly put out like chili pepper license plates and all sorts of stuff and claimed Colorado it. beat them to it. They tried. No, and we didn't. all know that Colorado chili is garbage compared to New Mexico <laughs> chili. I'm just telling you, man. I don't care what anybody Colorado says. Colorado got the license plates 
um, officiated by their state government first. However, New Mexico, it took too long for the state uh, legislator to get their stuff together and approve the license plate request. So when it came time to these license plates actually being put into production, um, New Mexico and Colorado were like dead even. And I believe they published or printed their plates on the same day. However, on the books, legally, Colorado got theirs out first. So it doesn't count then. I think New Mexico was first with these big <laughs> now, giant billboards. The thing, as far as chili peppers are concerned and the evolution and cultivation of them, most scientists that work on green chili or chili peppers of the Southwest have all come from New Mexico or there's like two from California. So New Mexico, green chili. Well, there you go. Yes. Well, according to the UFO stuff here, right? Dundee is the home to Benson's hideaway which is a local bar claiming itself to be UFO headquarters. Okay. Right. And the owner basically collects photos of UFOs and stuff taken by locals, and he puts them on display along with a jar containing what he says is the real body of an alien. No. (laughs) And Benson also, and the guy's name is Benson too, so Mm -hmm. right. Uh, um, Basically, he hosts Dundee's annual UFO days at the hideaway, which includes the sharing of stories like his own involving crop circles and unusual lights in the area. Now, in 1975, uh, on the opposite side of the state, in Elmwood, a police officer claimed to have witnessed a fireball hundreds of feet across in the night sky. In addition, this officer, Officer George Wheeler, claimed he was knocked unconscious by a UFO the next year in an incident corroborated uh, by at least one other witness. Oh, wow. And so to, uh, to commemorate those events, Elmwood holds its UFO days. Every yeah. July. And I'm looking on Google right now. Every July, mid-July, UFO days in Benson and then Wisconsin Frights. And it lists all these UFO. They've been doing this stuff for like 30 years. Since like 75, right? Yeah. And then, the, you know, of course, in Wisconsin, you know, it's towards the southern border, you have unexplained lights in the sky that were reported in 1987 by residents of the town in Belleville. And all those sightings were dismissed by some authorities. Uh, witnesses like uh, Glenn Casimir, a local police officer, insist that the objects were extraterrestrial in nature mm-hmm. in the event. And similar ones reported later that year is commemorated by, uh, or in the fall, at Belleville's annual UFO days. Oh. So where's the UFO capital of Wisconsin? Apparently there's no clear answer. But there are interesting reasons that all three of those towns claim the UFO capital. So I will admit this article grabbed me because it said UFO capital and the idea that, you know, people were fighting over UFO capital. I'm like, I'm going to check it out. Of course, this was on coast to coast AM. Yeah. We have a link to the website where you can read the article as well. So at the end of the day, it's like, if you like UFOs and you're in Wisconsin or traveling through, chances are, you know, there's a couple of festivals that you could go to and I mean, like, enjoy it. What stinks is like, they're all at, like different intervals, kind of, you know. Well, I mean, so. I'm, you know, I think if they try to do it all at the same time, and you know, yeah, would create issues. And also, part of the reason why this gives us, you know, interest is that we we do conferences and conventions and things like and festivals and stuff like that. So, the idea, you know, of of going to one of these and and doing stuff is pretty interesting. We <laughs> like it because we're sort of involved with that sort of thing. But, I mean, if you're in, in Wisconsin, there's like three festivals you can do oh. if you're going to ride around and sell your UFO stuff. I wish we had a UFO festival here in North Carolina. Yep. Yeah. Well, we did it one time. Yeah. And we did it one time, and there was a bunch of cool UFO people there. Like Mike Barra. Yeah. Yeah. And that hasn't happened hmm. this two years now. So. Yeah. Anyway, so there you go. If you're looking for uh, which town is the real UFO was ca- uh, capital, it's basically talking about Wisconsin, which is cheese and beer, and there you go. Yeah, and see, I was thinking capital of the United States, not like yeah, of no. Wisconsin. Yeah, yeah, nope. So, which town is the real UFO capital? Because if you Wisconsin, s- then finish the whole article title. Don't leave it like at a hanger because I'm going to click called and look for clickbait. I know, and you have bit it. So did I. Mm-hmm. So speaking of this, uh, every so often uh, we kind of well, we're, we're getting ready to wrap up the podcast. We kind of we we like to talk about something that we used to have in a podcast for a long time, and then we kind of stopped doing it. And it was basically 
you know, we would we like to do the news. We like to read paranormal and weird news. And some of the weird news that we used to see was kind of funny in nature. And one of them was it was like Florida man or Albuquerque woman. Yes, because all doing of these, crazy stuff. All of these outrageous news articles that we would find. A majority of them, of course, were Florida man, which, you know, he's got his own Reddit thread. Some news sites even have their own Florida section. Or it would be something extremely outrageous or, like, crazy, and it would be from Albuquerque. Even if it didn't happen within Albuquerque and it happened someplace else, like in Colorado, or even, like, southern like southern New Mexico or even Texas, the article would start off with, an Albuquerque woman. <laughs> yeah. Because, <laughs> and an example would be, I think it was like, um, an Albuquerque woman had like driven with like a whole bunch of marijuana, like illegal marijuana, not medical, and like fifteen cats, and she got stopped by Homeland Security, like, like I think like in El Paso or something. Yeah. But the article started an Albuquerque woman. <laughs> Yeah, it's been some crazy New Mexico type stories. You know, and, you know, one of them was, if I remember correctly, um, this Albuquerque woman's spouse was arrested for DUI, and so she was called to come get him, and she showed up drunk, <laughs> and then she tried to run the cop down and was like doing donuts, chasing him around the parking lot, and yeah, so that her spouse or whatever could get away. It, it was a thing, and it was, and then like th- nobody got hurt. But it was kind of funny in a And then a sort of week way. later, an Albuquerque woman had gotten arrested for driving while intoxicated. Well, being under the influence, but the article was that her eight-year-old grandson was driving the car. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, just to get you guys familiar with the Albuquerque woman versus what you guys are familiar with, Florida man. Yeah. You know, there's always And that lady crazy. who is like gently stabbing her boyfriend because he complained about burritos or something like that. Or tamales. tamales. It was like, <laughs> her just, tamales recipe. She's only like stabbing him a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> and it said that in the article. Yeah, just, just, you know, a little, little so gentle stab. gave stabbing. him a little stab. <laughs> yeah. Gave him a little stab to let him know. I was not happy that he was unhappy with my tamales. So we're going to kind of bring this whole segment back or at least try to by. When we run across it, we'll put it in here. Yeah. So here we go. A Florida woman, a Florida man or Albuquerque woman. Yep. You have to guess. Blank is arrested after trying to throw a baby alligator onto the roof of a cocktail lounge. Um, is that Florida man or Albuquerque woman? Am I guessing? Yeah. Okay. There's only two of us, and I read it, so it would be <laughs> SBU. Well, we, we could ask the listeners, but, you know. It would be a long um, time waiting. Yeah. Well, this one is easy because obviously it, it says a baby alligator, but you never know because there's weird animals in New Mexico too. Well, and you know, it's funny you bring it up. Um, Breaking Bad was a very popular series that everyone in New Mexico was very proud of. Mm-hmm. And one of the things is uh, one of the houses is became famous because the pizza kept getting thrown on the roof. <laughs> yep. You know what I mean? So I could see, you know, somebody's arrested for trying to throw pizza on the roof or whatever. So that was, it was a thing. Okay. That's a good argument. Along with being able to buy candy, blue crystal meth candy. That's actually rock candy. Dye which candy. is rock candy. And you could sell it to your, you know, the kids were buying it. Yeah. And it was like, you should give this to your kids. And it's like, this is basically. Encouraging drug use. Yeah. I, I kind of, you know, anyway. Yeah. It goes back to the candy cigarette thing, too. So <laughs> I kind of get where they come from. So what is your guess? Is it Florida man or Albuquerque woman? I don't know. That alligator, I'm going to have to guess Florida. Yes. Yeah. And it basically says Florida man <laughs> tries to throw a live gator onto building's roof and he got arrested. Mm. Which is funny until you read the article. And, you know, the article, basically he really sort of mistreated the alligator, which is not cool to be stomping on an alligator like that. Yeah. However... The article where we grabbed this from is from New Mexico. So it's like even New Mexico is reporting Florida man, almost yeah. like they're trying to take the heat off of them a little bit. Now, granted, so. the, the first paragraph, which is pretty much all that needs to be read, is a Florida man told police officers he was teaching it a lesson <laughs> yeah. when he tried to throw a live alligator that he had stolen from a miniature golf course onto the roof of a beachside cocktail lounge. Yeah. Now, we have 
basically come across Florida men articles where they were like, one guy um, threw one through a drive through window. Yeah. Uh, you know, stuff like that. One guy got arrested <laughs> uh, for driving drunk and his co-pilot was an alligator. That was pretty funny. Yeah, it was that all was in this, good. It was like a, I think it was like a five-foot alligator. It was, it was in the seat, all yeah. seat belted in. He was like driving. <laughs> so, you know, hey, it is what it is, right? Mm-hmm. But yeah, he tried to throw the live alligator or live gator on the roof. And this was in Daytona Shores. Okay. So he was teaching a lesson. <laughs> it's like, he was like, it's, that's what I expect to see. I am glad that he's being charged with possession and injury of an alligator. Yeah. Good. Good. He shouldn't hurt an alligator. And he's also being charged with unarmed burglary of an occupied dwelling. <laughs> and theft and criminal mischief. Okay. So, yeah. He got it from the, I like that, nearby miniature golf course. Yeah. So, and an online court document showed that the man has no attorney. So, he, he remained in jail. He should bring the alligator. <laughs> yeah. So, I don't know. So, anyway, I think we're going to go ahead and wrap it up. This particular episode of the Creep Geeks podcast. Yep. Episode number 222. So, there you go. So, thanks, guys, for tuning in. Again, uh, show notes, if you want to follow along with anything that we've talked about on this podcast episode, be sure to follow us on social media. Stop in, hit the like button, say hi. We have an active Facebook page, a Facebook group. We are on Twitter as well as TikTok and Instagram. So be sure to follow us and like us on there. Let us know you're you're into whatever we talk about or give us some show suggestions. Um, thanks to our Patreon supporters. If you're interested in supporting us on Patreon, you can always visit the links in the show notes. There you go. Mm-hmm. All right, so anyway, uh, join us again. Episode number 223 will be coming out. In episode number 223, we're going to talk about all sorts of interesting stuff, but primarily it's going to be about Brown Mountain Lights. We have some listener comments, and we met a patron by proxy. Oh. So, yeah. So, there you go. Yeah. So, anyway, any questions, comments, concerns, let us know. But we do appreciate you listening, and uh, we'll see you again. Yep.